Thank you for the invitation to talk about this. I'm not going to talk at great length today, but I do want to set the scene, both in terms of what the Scottish Government is trying to achieve and also where we are in what is a very complex process. But let me start by what I think this debate is about. And it's not in the, it's quite important to remember that the European Union is not, in the words of Martin Schulz, the former president of the parliament, it's not an accountants club. A lot of this debate is about the economics, about whether a country can survive and prosper outside the EU, about whether money coming into the country will be the same, greater or lesser. What this is about is the type of country we want to live in. What this is about is the type of people we want to be and how we want to relate to others. A hard Brexit will, in my view, lead to a hard Britain, a society in which we don't necessarily wish to live, a society which uh, does not value cooperation, a society that is on a race to the bottom. So when I am involved with others in trying to negotiate a way forward, this to me is very much about the type of Scotland we jointly wish to create and the type of Scotland we wish to live in. And that is what this document is about, Scotland's place in Europe, a document which we published in, uh, on the 20th of uh, uh, December last year and which sketches out what we think is a possible way forward to, to square a circle. And the circle is this, the people of Scotland voted 62% to 38% to remain in the EU. But the UK government believes it has a mandate from the whole of the UK, um, uh, which voted narrowly to leave, to take the whole of the UK out of the EU. So that is a circle we have to square. And we believe the proposals in this document do it. And there's a, a hierarchy of proposals. The first of which was for the whole of the UK to stay within the single market. And the single market is really shorthand for the way in which we would continue to work and cooperate together and meet the highest standards in a whole range of areas, including employment protection and human rights. That was our first preference. And uh, the Prime Minister decided not to do that. She announced that without consultation with the devolved administrations and indeed 48 hours before the devolved administrations were due to discuss the issue with the UK government. That's her business. So the second option in this paper is for Scotland to stay in the single market. This paper has been well received. People have accepted that it is a difficult ask, but it's not an impossible ask. And indeed, many of the positions that the UK government take are equally difficult. So we think that that is a realistic prospect and we continue to try attempt to negotiate that with the UK government because it is the UK government is a negotiating party. And the third thing in this paper is about the changes to devolution that would have to take place in order to allow that option to go forward. But in any case, we are entirely new and uncharted constitutional waters. And whatever happens, there needs to be a review of the way in which power is distributed in these islands, not least because many powers will be repatriated from Brussels, and many of those powers need to come to Scotland. There was a promise during the referendum campaign that if the people, uh, people voted to leave, powers would automatically be transferred. Now, that promise is uh, perhaps uh, not being heard as much these days. In fact, I have a, a meeting with other ministers today about it, including UK ministers. But we have to insist that this is an opportunity uh, to look again at how power is distributed and make sure it's distributed better. Now, this document represents a compromise. This is a document which was drawn up after a resolution of the Scottish Parliament last June, almost immediately after the referendum, that said uh, we want the Scottish Government to look at the options, to work out the best options, and to come back and to pursue those options. And that's what we did. Worked very closely with a huge range of people to try and draw these options up. And then we went back to the Scottish Parliament, and the Parliament endorsed this document too by majority. So this document represents how we wish to move forward. And we've discussed it with a wide range of organizations, including STVO. We've discussed uh, the, the content of this document, and we've had a response to it. The people we've not had a response from are actually the UK government. And despite the fact it's been on the table for two months, we've not had a view from them of what they wish to do. And given that we are very close to, five weeks on Friday is the end of March, considering we're very close to the triggering of Article 50, the formal process of saying 
that the UK wants to leave, which the Prime Minister said will take place before the end of March. Given that timescale, we need to have a response to this document and to the key issues in this document. A response about how Scotland is involved in that Article 50 process, how the differentiated solution in here is mentioned within that formal uh, letter and then negotiated by the UK with the other parties. Uh, a, a discussion about how Scotland is involved in the negotiating process because we clearly have major issues to discuss uh, and issues for which we are responsible, devolved competencies, which we cannot have traded away by other people. A discussion about the rebalancing of power, a discussion about how powers come back to uh, the Scottish Parliament. And there are all things that we need to achieve. But we need to bear in mind the important uh, issue of how we ensure that our people of Scotland are protected from the difficulties that will also arise from Brexit, because there will be substantial difficulties. There will be substantial financial difficulties in areas which have relied upon investment from the EU. There will be important difficulties in repatriating legislation, the so-called Great Repeal Bill and what follows on from that, uh, and uh, the First Minister's Council of Experts on the European Union has been very active in considering that matter, including Alan Miller, who uh, has, I think, formulated the, a way to look at this, which is particularly helpful, which is that none of the present powers, none of the present protections uh, should be eroded in any way. That's the first principle. Things should not go backwards. Secondly, that if progress continues to be made on employment protection, on human rights and other issues in Europe, on the environment, that progress should be mirrored in what happens in Scotland. But thirdly, we would have the ability to go further, to in actual fact create the options and the opportunities to do things in a better way. And we're applying that right across the board. Now I know that the organizations at the gathering have made clear through the SCVO survey some of their priorities. And those priorities have informed and are informing the negotiating process. The negotiating process takes place through the Joint Ministerial Committee structure, which has never been a particularly satisfactory structure, but which we're trying to make work for this, and also through bilateral and other meetings. And I had a bilateral meeting yesterday in London. And we continue to try and uh, negotiate the best way forward. But I can't guarantee it. And I want to make that a concluding point before we start discussing things. I can't guarantee what will take place. This is a very difficult process. And it's not made any easier by the fact that we don't believe that the UK government has essentially been listening to what Scotland and Wales and some part Northern Ireland have been arguing, that there needs to be a different approach to this. It cannot be, in the words of the Prime Minister, that as the UK entered Europe as one nation, it will leave as one nation. What that does not take account of is 40 years of constitutional change. Devolution did not exist in 1975, 74, 75, when the final deal in Europe was agreed through a referendum. This is a very different set of circumstances. And therefore, in this difficult and, in my view, unnecessary process, because I do want to stress that, it's not a process that I and, and many others think is the right thing to do, but in this difficult and unnecessary process, there must be a place, a central place, for the interests of the devolved nations and their concerns. And they are not necessarily the same concerns as are being expressed south of the border. We have, I think, a different perspective, particularly on the two key issues that um, are the focus of the UK government's position, that of migration and the powers of courts outside the, outside the UK. So I'm very happy to respond to points if people have points to make once we start the discussion, um, and also to update you on where we actually are. But this is very much a work in progress it can and should be influenced by organizations in this room and more widely in Scotland. And it is at heart, and I stress where I started, I'll finish. It is at heart about who we see ourselves being and the type of country we want to be. And that is why it is so important that we get it right. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Teresa Shearer. I am Chief Executive of Enable Scotland. That's my day job. My second job is as a trustee of SCVO. And on behalf of SCVO, could I thank the Minister for those remarks? Thank you very much, Minister. That was wonderful. 
Um, it was wonderful, not just because of the content, but actually when we were coming into the room today, I spoke to the minister and said, I'm a bit concerned, there's not a lot of people here, the, the, obviously the storm has had an impact, and he was saying, it doesn't matter how many people are here, it's the debate that we have today, and I think that's an important point to bear in mind, that actually the questions that will come are the really important part from the minister to hear from the third sector, what are our concerns about Brexit, and what are some of our issues and solutions. So with that in mind, I'd like to invite both panellists to say a couple of words, maybe about two or three minutes each. I'd like to introduce the panellists first. Um, on my far right, there's Paul Reddish, who is Chief Executive of Project Scotland. Um, Paul and I have a couple of things in common. We both are charity chief execs, and we both have young children. Next to Paul, there is Graham Roy, who's the director of the Fraser Valander Institute at Strathclyde University. Unfortunately, Graham and I have less in common, I think it's fair to say. I did one year of economics at Strathclyde and found it very tough and so changed to politics. However, Graham thankfully has stayed with economics and is now one of our foremost thinkers in terms of economic policy in Scotland today. So if I could open up with Graham for two or three minutes for some opening remarks, that would be useful. Thanks, Graham. to come along and speak to you today. As an economist, to speak for two minutes is really quite hard. For an economist to speak on Brexit for two minutes is nigh on impossible, so <laughs> I'll do my best. I just want to say kind of three key things that are shaping our thinking that might be quite useful for you. Because the first thing is just to, to make the point that Brexit is highly uncertain and it's exceptionally complex. And what's going to happen over the next few years if an economist tells you or a politician, with all due respect, tells you what's going to happen, then we just really don't know. And to be fair in the Scottish Government, I think their paper in Europe was really quite clear about that, pointing out the uncertainties and the complexities that are involved in all of this. And it, that's quite important for Scotland, you know, so that we know that Europe is our largest international export destination, so about 40% of all Scottish exports go into, international exports go into the European Union. So what happens to that trading relationship? whether we're in the single market, whether we're part of the customs union, et cetera, et cetera, really, really matters for, for Scotland's economy. But it, possibly in contrast to the, some other parts of the UK, there's also some other key issues within that that also matter for the Scottish economy. So we know that if you look at Scotland's population over the last few years, um, one of the key drivers for the growth that we've had in the Scottish population has been a rise in migration from the European Union. So around about half of the increase in Scotland's population in recent years has come from an inflow of, of EU migrants. And we know that Scotland's population is ageing more quickly than the rest of the UK. So what happens to that access to skilled migrants and skilled workers is going to be really crucial. We also know that Scotland's economy has actually done really quite well in attracting international investment. So we tend to rank about second in the UK behind London in terms of attracting that investment. So again, what happens to that sort of investment becomes really quite important. So Brexit is going to be crucial. But actually, the second thing I would say in all of this is it's important not to lose sight of the fact that what's happening in the day-to-day -day economy, what's happening in the domestic agenda, is really, really crucial as well. So we know that Scotland's economy has been relatively fragile over the last few years. We know that we're dealing with continued challenges in the public finances, which will be having a day-to-day a -day impact on yourself. So there's an importance of making sure that we work closely and we work carefully on what Brexit will mean, but also thinking about the day-to-day -day job and the, the challenges that are in there. And in there, in terms of policy, I think there's a number of things that are quite crucial to look at, and that's my, my, my third and final point. I guess, firstly, there's the point about the role of providing as much clarity as possible from policymakers about what their um, priorities are and the negotiating elements, and that is ultimately going to be crucial as we go through this period of uncertainty, not to add to that. I think the, 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 the second point I would make is, again, is coming back to this point about the domestic agenda. There's an important role here for us to try and provide as much clarity as we can around what's happening in, in the elements that we do control. And I was really struck yesterday by the strong messages coming out here of the returns to multi-year budgeting, for example. And in a world of uncertainty, there strikes me as being no reason why we should add to that uncertainty by having one-year settlements and movements to things like three-year settlements become absolutely crucial. And then the final point I would make is there's obviously part of the negotiating elements 
we, we can do quite a lot by just providing certainty and, and clear guidance of what we're doing. The one that jumps out to me is the rights and conditions of EU citizens at the moment. It strikes me as something which there doesn't seem to be any reason why we cannot come to some quick agreement with the rest of Europe that whatever happens, the rights and conditions and the people who live and work here should be, uh, should be protected and respected. Um, so in three, three minutes, hopefully, that's my kind of key con contributions. I'm more than happy to have a discussion and to debate some of these issues as we go. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Graeme. That was wonderful. It was four minutes, actually, but that's okay. <laughs> I think that's allowed. Um, and I think what Graeme's given us here is a flavour of some of the economic issues, but also some of the wider issues that are impacting Scotland in general, but specifically the third sector. And, and I think that's important about today is to try and get that focus back on the third sector and the debate beyond the economy. Um, Paul, I think you're going to give us quite a bit of beyond the economy from your perspective. So if I can ask you for, you can have the same four minutes, that would be fine. Great, four minutes. Um, that's, that's good because last time I was asked to speak by SCVO, they gave me, I think, six minutes. So oh. I've been cut down to two <laughs> minutes. I thought the next time I'd be asked, I would just be there for the photos, maybe. Um, okay, I, I've been asked to talk a little bit about the impact on the, the sector. Um, but given the time involved, um, I'm, I'm going to focus on one or two really specific things, which is, you know, what is our role and what is the sector and, and what sort of thing do we need to be doing now and in the future? Um, to help support politicians in particular um, in the changes that are going to happen. The key thing when we think about our sector, you know, it is a large, diverse sector. It's, it's five billion turnover, over 100,000 employees, over a million volunteers across Scotland tackling a number of issues. If you can wrap it up, the way I think about the sector is if you've got other people that are the voice of, of industry and fishery, and we're the voice of the people on the ground. We're the voice of communities. And we're the social conscience of Scotland. And that's really important in this negotiation, particularly when we're talking about different trade agreements with other countries that may have different values. You know, we've got to play a strong role in ensuring that Scotland stays true to its values through this process um, and that we're informing the impact of potential changes and decisions. Um, no, we don't know what Brexit will mean, but there are some things that we do know. We know there's no going back, so there's no point saying, um, you know, we'd like it to be the way it is before, even in any deal that the Scottish government strikes, you know, with everything that's happening in America and, and, and the UK, you know, the, that world of two years ago is behind us. So we have to look at positive solutions for the future. And the only way to do that, rather than getting bogged down for us in hard Brexit and soft Brexit and other things, is to focus on the issues for Scotland. Um, we work a lot with young people, and, and the thing that young people are saying is jobs, human rights, and impact on public services. So rather than focusing on hard Brexit and soft Brexit, we've got to focus on those messages. They're the three things that young people are saying. They're the ones that are going to have to carry the decisions that we make in the next two years that change the way our country's set up. So that needs to be our message and, and, and what we focus on. I was struck at the last uh, session I did on, on Brexit. I was asked a question by somebody who was in public affairs, and they said, you know, how can we have a voice and say things when actually the majority of our members voted to leave. They were an older person's cherry. And I, I remember saying to them, it's, you know, I know it's difficult trying to strike that balance, but if we're timid right now, stuff will change anyway and things will happen and we'll miss the debate. So this is an opportunity for you guys to, to speak to the minister directly. We're, we're very fortunate in Scotland that um, ministers are, are, are open to conversation and dialogue. Yesterday, the first minister invited us to be a critical friend. Um, and we need to do that, and, and we can't waste our time waiting to hear the details of what Article 50 needs to look like. And I'm going to give you one tangible example to finish on. My workforce today that helps young people get into jobs, if European social funds stopped and nothing was replaced, I think about 40% of that workforce would go. Okay? That's fine. We can take on face value that... that um, European Social Fund continues to 2018. But the last time we started a discussion on a budget for European Social Fund, it took three years. So if Brexit's going to take two years and five days, to uh, five weeks to sort out, we're already behind the discussions in what's <laughs> going to happen when ESF finishes. So we need to be having conversations with ministers now about the financial impact on the sector and our ability to deliver on the things that young people and other people in Scotland have said are important today. And that message has got to start. 
Okay, thanks for that, Paul. So that was very insightful. And, and what we took from Paul's remarks here were three key points, one around young people, one around timescales, and probably the most important part before we open up for questions, which is not to be timid. And so if you were following Twitter this morning, I was saying looking forward to some really engaging debate today and some questions for the panel. And I want to go back to the point that we do have the opportunity with the Minister here. We have a relatively small audience, so I think this is a huge opportunity to ask some of those burning questions that you want to talk about, about Brexit and what the implications are for the third sector. If I can just put down a couple of small rules, if you can say your name, the organisation that you work for, and then state your question, I'll then help direct those questions around. So John's walking around the room with a microphone. Can I have the first question from the audience, please? First of many, I hope. Yes. Hi there, I'm David Howey, I'm actually not with organisation, I'm a politics and economics student with the Open University, a member of Health Literature Alliance Scotland. Picking up on what you mentioned there about investment in regard to human capital, young people, skills. Uh, now, they will bear the bargain, uh, sorry, bear the cost of us leaving today. Um, oh, sorry, I'm leaving in two years' time. With regards to the policy we put in today, how can we invest in the young people to tell them about the social, not just social enterprises ourselves? Because that's part of the conversation today by Cat's Fiverr comes in. They, we don't know this is on. The general public don't know we're here. So how the hell do we get that point of course, if I'm not actually talking to people, apart from myself. Okay, really good question, which I think in, in principle is about the communication around this issue about Brexit. So I think it's perfect. What you're saying is we're talking about it amongst ourselves, but how do we communicate more widely? So if I can start with the Minister with that question, if that's okay. Yeah, I mean, we've got an opportunity here to you know, hear about the key issues, and I think we should do so. I think we should talk about the issues, not necessarily the process around the issues. Um, but in terms of communication, yes, it's a challenge because people's eyes are beginning to glaze over. I mean, I, I often say that, you know, they used to say that uh, St Kilda was the smallest piece of ground about which the most had been written. Uh, and Brexit <laughs> is now the sort of, the, the, the smallest topic about which the most has been written. Because we don't actually know, as, as, as Graham said, what's going to happen. But there's a vast literature and people are getting, you know, a little bit bored by it. So we have to communicate on some key things and the, and the key is values. It is about values, it is about who we want to be and what we want to be and how we have got here. And if we can touch people on the issue of their values, the society they want to live in, the way they want to live their lives, then I think we'll get some communication going and strip out a lot of the technical detail, which is pretty baffling at times. Okay. Um, Graham, can I ask you to come in on that point? One of the things that often causes the most confusion when communicating is the economics of Brexit. I know we're not going to focus on that today, but how do you communicate in an accessible way to the people of Scotland what the potential implications are? <coughs> it, it's, a, it's a very good question, and um, one of the key challenges in all of this is uh, exactly your point. How do you start to communicate these issues and discuss it with actual people who are going to deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I guess that's where you know, events like today, but also engagement with people like us as, uh, as academics and people trying to inform the debate becomes absolutely crucial. So we are really open to having a discussion about you know, what is it that we are saying that's helpful for, you know, to communicate with your people. Actually, where are we just completely missing the boat? Is our conversation or how are we engaging is actually not hitting the mark and is actually not really engaging with the types of people that you're, you're interested in. Um, the challenge is though that Brexit is going to be exceptionally sexually complex and it's going to be really difficult and it's going to affect people in really, really different ways. Um, but I think that's even more important that we put the effort in um, to actually try and engage in this debate because the point's right. If we don't, then essentially you're going to end up with you know, who's got the biggest voice and who's got the loudest voice. Uh, and that might not be the people who it actually is going to impact on most significantly. Okay, thanks, Paul. Any thoughts from you on communications? Um, I mean, other than what I'd, I'd already said about focusing on the, the issues rather than the, the, the process and ensuring that drives the debate, the, the, the only other thing I would add in communicating with, with people, it, it is challenging at the moment with um, how polarised different sides are on things across social media and how people are consuming information. It, it, it isn't easy to get the facts out there, and we've got, you know... Uh, it's easy for us to have forums like this, but we've got to work out smarter ways of doing it. And we also have to recognise that Scotland in itself is diverse. I mean, 38% of people did vote to leave the EU. So, 
You know, we can't just assume that the whole of Scotland wants to stay in the EU because <laughs> it doesn't. Um, so uh, I think it's important that we're not just pushing a directive message. We are having debates. We're understanding what people's issues are, um, why they may have voted to leave, what, what their concerns are. And, and certainly as a sector, you know, um, being the ones that are connected with people on the ground, particularly those that face inequalities, we, we've got to be that voice and, and ensure that diversity is listened to and heard. Yeah, I'm going to ask the Minister just to come back in on that. Yeah. I think there's an important point in there about the people who voted to leave. It is important to understand where they come from. Um, and some of that is, is quite easy to do. I mean, you know, I represent Argyll and Butte, strong parts of it, strong fishing constituency. Uh, fishermen and women who are actually catching at that side of the industry almost unanimously voted to leave and they felt that they had been let down over several generations by the common fisheries policy. Uh, and that's, that's solvable because you can address that as a policy issue and you can find a way to solve it. It's much harder where people have voted because of things that they understand to be true from the tabloid and other press perhaps, which aren't true. I mean, Graham makes a very good point about migration. Actually, 90% of the population growth anticipated in the next 20 years comes from migration. So far from it being a bad thing, we need it. Again, you know, looking at my own experience as a constituency MSP, I represent an area that's losing population very fast. Some places are going to be empty unless we have people coming to us. And the best way to do that is through free movement because that's been a uniquely successful way of doing it. You know, and if you look at, I'm not an economist, but if you look at the economic value of migrants, it is positive. Now, we need to be able to say those things, and therefore, we've not just got to tell people things, we've got to change minds sometimes. Yeah. And again, that is about values, and it is about the importance of the European project, essentially. Uh, it, and be, playing that into a, a press and a media that's very hostile to it. OK. Um, I'd like to build on that point and take Keir's privilege and ask around migration in particular, and values and think about the social care workforce and the health workforce in particular. So if we have anyone from those sectors, I'd be really interested to hear a question from you. Oh, we've got a couple. Yes. Okay, Elliot Stark, uh, Strive. Um, there's some links to um, um, what you've just said, uh, t Teresa, but not, not entirely. So my, my question is, I, I have a worry about any Brexit situation and how this might impact. Um, the most vulnerable in our society, um, inclusive of how we reach out to, to refugees as well. Um, I think there's a continuing assault on the welfare state and a continuing assault on citizens' rights. Um, my question is how we in, in Scotland can practically bring our values to minimise these potential horrific consequences of what Brexit would bring us. Okay, great question. Not quite what I was looking for, Elliot, but thank you. I see someone else had a question about social care. I'll come back to them. So around values and particularly looking about people who, refugees, and, and, and might be at the sharp end of this, should this go ahead as a hard Brexit. Minister, would you like to pick up on that point first? Yeah, I mean, it goes very much to the heart of what we've been talking about, and that's clear, I think, from all of us in, in this platform who've been saying the same thing. There, you cannot minimise what that threat is because it's very substantial. You know, I, I unfortunately have to take part in those discussions first of Scotland with people who are absolutely obsessed, first of all, by migration and the fact that it must stop, and that means stop. You know, I mean, it's, it's not a soft Brexit, it's stopping it because it's imagined to be in some way harmful. Um, and the second one is that you must reject essentially influences from elsewhere. That's what the argument about courts outside the UK is. You mustn't have anybody interfering with what you do. And that's because their vision of the society they want to live in is, is a very hard society indeed. And society that is, looks for the triumph of the fittest and has little compassion at all. That's not the society I want to see in Scotland. I want us to get better at what we do, not worse. So it, will, it comes down to the choice between those two societies. And therefore, you know, at bottom, we can't go along with that hard Brexit. And that must be the choice. Now, how then can we choose not to go along with it? That's what we've been trying to find. And, you know, we've, we've put forward a compromise solution, which we believe would do that. If the United Kingdom government does not accept that compromise solution, then it is, in my view, inevitable that there is only one further option, which is to say to the people of Scotland, do you want that society, or do you want to choose independence and try and have this society? Now, you know, I, I don't think actually that's, there's any doubt that's where we're moving to, 
We don't have to get there because we have tried in the, in the national interest and in working across the parliament to find another way of doing this. But it does take two to tango on this occasion. And you know, we don't, we're not on the dance floor presently with, with them. So we have to find a way to either engage them in that or make that choice. And the Article 50 letter, which sounds very technical, but is the moment at which that information, you know, the, the, the notification is given to Europe, is very important. I noticed David Mundell saying to the Scottish Parliament European Committee that it wasn't that important. He said that yes, it would just be part of the process. No, that's a, that's a red line. I don't like negotiating red lines, but it is a red line, because what it says is, you know, this is the moment at which we say what we're going to do. Now, if that letter says, and, and we've been saying this openly, if that letter says a, a differentiated deal for Scotland should be negotiated and discussed with the European partners, then maybe we can make some progress. If it doesn't, they have to say to ourselves, what can we do? So there are no easy choices in this, but I agree with you what the choice is. And we've been, I've been trying over the last six months to, to, to get that choice made, but we haven't succeeded yet. Okay, interesting point um, about how do we choose not to go along with it, Paul? Can you come back on that? Yeah, well, I, I think um, one of the, uh, this is for me back to about simplifying what it's about first for people because Brexit is so confusing and you know, um, if you go back to the independence um, referendum as well, a lot of people were not confused, but you know, the, there's a lot of debate going on on both sides. And I, I think, you know, the, the, the point that Mike made, which I'll, I'll, I'll try and cement here, which is, you know, the debate that we need to get on, which is, well, what sort of country do we want to be known for? And actually that will drive decisions about whether the Brexit deal that we get hard, soft is right or wrong and whether we should or shouldn't be in Europe and whether we should or shouldn't be independent. And I think sometimes people leap to, are you yes or no, are you this or that and the other? And you miss that, that debate. And, you know, as a country, Scotland, you know, I, I've lived here 12 years now. And one of the things I'm proud about is, is its values and how, what it stands for socially. Um, and we've got to protect that. And we've and not only have we got to protect that, we've got to uh, help drive a debate that keeps that at the core of, of, of you know, how other people make decisions. And that's what's going to help get a bit of momentum around the deal that we want, whether it be Brexit related or, or, or anything else politically. And, and I think sometimes we get lost in these acronyms that the media has put together and hard this and soft that, and we've, we've, we've got to focus on what's important. Okay. Graeme, any thoughts on how the Fraser Valander Institute can help support that debate and, and help take it beyond the economics, given that's the reason data for your institution? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, <clears throat> the one thing I would just, I mean, a general point about the economics within all of this, I think there's something about Brexit will set the context and the framework for the economics, but within there, there's quite a lot of um, opportunities to, to respond to some of the challenges that will come out of Brexit, but also some of the, op some of the opportunities that will come from it as well. And I think, the, this, you know, picking up on the point there about the, the, the more we focus on the issues so we understand what could be driving some of the results that we end up with becomes absolutely crucial, I think, for all of this. And, and I think that's where, you know, coming back to my introductory remarks, there's, there's an issue about understanding what Brexit as a package might mean, but then it's then what happens what, what do you do with it? And whether that be under a different constitutional settlement or whether that be under the current framework or a different arrangement or transition arrangement or whatever, but then becomes what do you actually do with the policies and the opportunities that, that, that come from that? Um, because as, as you mentioned, there's no going back from this. So it's about identifying the new challenges, the new opportunities, and where you can move to from an economic perspective. And I think that's where the debate really will start to need to move to uh, in relatively short order. Great, perfect time for some more questions. Yep, one from others. Hi, Graham Fitzsimmons from Cornerstone Community Care. Um, I think firstly, Paul, um, I, I very much welcome your comments. Uh, if I was sitting up there, I'd be saying the same thing about there's no going back um, and we need to focus on positive solutions. I would maybe go even slightly further than that and saying that as well as recognising the opportunities we may or may not have, we will probably be in a position where we have to go and find them as well. We have to work hard to look to see where the solutions are. Collaboration is very much part of that. And, and Teresa, specifically to, to social care, um, we all know the figures for the ageing demographics. We all know where we'll be in 2035. We won't have enough people to care for our elderly. 
despite, sorry, as well as the fact that we have some of the brightest and most talented people working for us coming from the EU, we also rely very heavily on the provision of services from people coming from the EU. Regardless of where we are in five years, it can't be negotiable that we can't allow that to continue. Um, what can we do to make sure, regardless of the outcome of anything, any changes in negotiations over the next five years, to make it easy to, to recruit and to attract people from the EU to continue to come over to work in our social care and third sector industries? Because even at the moment, it's quite tricky sometimes to process the simplest of paperwork. Um, and recruitment and retention is, is hard and challenging enough at the moment without making that more complicated. So I'd welcome your thoughts on how we could possibly improve that and guarantee that in the future, regardless of where we are politically, that we can continue and, and improve how we attract the best talent from all over Europe. Thank you. So, thanks. I think Graeme's question is about social care is reliant on people coming in from the EU. Um, any thoughts, Minister and, and the panel, on how do we ensure that happens? That's our red line, I think, from a social care perspective, Graeme, is your point? Well, it is not possible to square that circle, to say we are against migration, but we want people to come here and work you know, in our social care industries or whatever. It's just not possible to hold those. No matter how skilled some politicians are, you can't hold positions that are diametrically opposed. And interesting, I think we see that in some of the rhetoric that's coming out of the UK government now. Yes, the Times had a front page piece about David Davis saying in uh, an unguarded moment, I think in, in the Baltic States where he was earlier this week, that he didn't think the number of migrants would reduce dramatically you know, for many years. Uh, and that's because he's recognizing that in the workforce, social care workforce, um, academic workforce, 25% of research staff in Scottish universities are from other EU countries, um, in agriculture, in innovation, in the tech sector, right across, we need people coming here. And Scotland needs them more than actually the UK does, and the UK still needs them. So you either have continued migration of that nature or you don't. If you have it, the best way to have it is through the four freedoms, through freedom of movement. It's comparatively seamless. You're right to say it's not completely seamless, but it's comparatively seamless. If you introduce quotas for particular sectors, it will become incredibly bureaucratic. You know, I mean, people in this room will have dealt with the border agency. I have met, dealt with the border agency as, as an elected member. That is not a happy process, and it won't be a happy process if this is what takes place. So they, they don't want a sectoral approach, but equally they, they're not going to freedom of movement. What does it look like? I don't know. I, don't think, I know they don't know, but that's a thing that has to be resolved. Our view is if you've got freedom of movement, the four freedoms work for us, we should continue to have it. That's why we're recommending continuing being in the EEA, because the European Economic Area because what that does is it guarantees continuation of the four freedoms. They have rejected that, so I don't know what the solution will be for them. For Scotland, we have to continue to have that, there is no doubt. I mean, economically, it's vital for us, it's vital for us in terms of social care, but it's also vital in who we are. We go back to the values. You know, we are a country that likes having people coming here, it works for us. We are, in William McIlvaney's famous phrase, a Mongol nation, and that's good for us. Okay, thank you. Any follow-ups from the panel? Uh, the, I mean, the only point just I would say to build on that, w one thing we need to be slightly careful with is, is, um, is trying to look at everything through a Brexit lens. And I think, you know, your point about what the challenges we've got in social care, for example, there's some really big challenges and some issues completely aside from Brexit. And I think we want to avoid essentially blaming Brexit on on everything in there, and I would argue that one of the biggest things that we need to do in, in social care is, is to invest in the sector, potentially make you know, work conditions, improve work conditions and develop it, etc. Et and that, there's quite a lot we can do domestically and within ourselves. Brexit is going to make it more challenging, make it a headwind in terms of attracting people, but there's some important issues we need to do in the sector in its own right. And I think we need to just avoid always, you know, putting saying Brexit is always going to be the challenge for everything because some real, there's some real issues you know, that you're dealing with before One of the that. key issues, and you know this from your, 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 your policy background, is you know, at least try not to make things worse. You know, I mean, there are huge problems that existed before Brexit, but if you, if you rely upon that workforce, you know, Brexit will make that worse. So don't specifically take actions that are going to damage your policy intentions. 
and, that, and, that, and Brexit is, and to that extent, and not right across the board, something that makes it more difficult to do things. Okay, I'm conscious of time and we're running slightly over because of the late start. Can we take one more question before we ask the Minister to wrap up for the final few minutes? Hi, um, it's Ali Cairns from SCVO here. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to ask the Minister if <clears throat> there's anything he can say about um, conversations you might have had with your other European colleagues on the outcome um, of the negotiations in terms of, I guess, your own, your own hunch um, on whether we'll have a, 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 an association agreement like Turkey or a bilateral agreement like Swi Switzerland. And, it's just, um, and the reason I ask is that our conversations with our European uh, colleagues and networks are, are, are beginning to um, feel a stronger sort of feedback that there's a growing sense that, that because of the issues with Putin and Trump, that Brexit's becoming smaller and smaller and we're, there's this idea that we've already gone um, and there's a, there's a kind of growing sense that it will be, it's going to become even more difficult for us to, you know, buy back into some of the things that I think that most people here hold dear in terms of becoming a program country at least, so we can buy back into, you know, Horizon 2020 and, and some of the research and innovation programs that we can buy back into volunteer exchange programs. And there's a sort of a growing sense of that, well, we're not, we're not bothered anymore. Uh, so I was just wondering if you could sort of, if there's anything you can say yourself in terms of your own hunch on, on the outcome based on conversations well, uh, with um, your European colleagues? Uh, I'm not going to predict the outcome. That would be incredibly <laughs> foolish of me to even try and predict the outcome. I think some things aren't going to happen. It's not going to be a Swiss arrangement. The Swiss arrangement relies on 160 different treaties. It's impossible. No, nobody on any side believes that can be done again. The Turkish arrangement is very tangential in terms of the customs union. You know, it doesn't, not even a complete customs union. I think, though, your point is right, that there is a feeling which, you know, we, th we see everything through the prism of, you know, the United Kingdom government, which thinks it's a big deal and it's, it's in charge. Actually, there's quite a big of, I, I was about to use the phrase piss-off factor, but that's true. People are just fed up with this. They just want to go away. And, in, you know, in many European countries, they think, Big deal as it is, because it is a big deal, uh, you know, it just needs to be over. They will also drive a hard bargain. You know, there's a big money at stake here in terms of the budget of the EU. Um, and there is also an absolute determination, and I, I think this is true right across, not to get into the position where anybody who leaves actually can do so in more favorable terms than staying. And that is a big, big issue for everybody. There's a very interesting Guardian info, mat, uh, infographic from earlier this week that analyzes the key issues for the various states, what the key issues are. And there's quite a lot of overlap. One of them is freedom of movement, where there's quite a lot of overlap, the pr preservation of the, the four freedoms. So I think your analysis is correct. I think this is going to be tougher even than the UK government expects. If there is, and there will be a deal, of course, when that deal takes place, it will not be favorable. But that is, they want to move on, they want to rebuild if you look at some of the dialogue that's going on in the European Parliament about it's about a different type of Europe. Europe is more responsive to its citizens. The type of Europe we would favour. So ironically, you know, we're in, uh, we're, our membership is, is at risk just at the time when the dialogue is going in the way that would be very favourable to us. And we should bear that in mind. There are things to be gained from it. Can I make a final point because I'm conscious of time? Sure. I think Graham mentioned something and I think you mentioned something too that's important. What is next in terms of grants and funding packages. And that is a real, that's something that is a problem for me and, and for others, and will be a problem undoubtedly for you, because it is true it takes a long time. You know, when I was environment minister and involved in the rural development program, I knew how long it took to get that into place. And there was a hiatus of months before people could apply, but at least we knew what was going to happen. There is nothing in place now about what is going to happen after 2019, 2020, you know, on any of the programs which people are accessing. And that is urgent work that needs to be undertaken, but it's driven by two things. One, by money, what money is going to be available, and it is not the 350 million pounds a week that's going to come back to health service, that's, that's a chimera. You know, this is going to cost us money in terms of, of the economy. But it's also driven about what you want to achieve and where you want to achieve it. Are these powers going to come back to the Scottish Parliament? Are we going to construct these schemes? And if so, how are they going to be resourced? 
Or are they going to be UK-wide schemes? If so, what input is Scotland going to have to them? Uh, and what's the criteria for them? You know, I, I know many communities in my own area who are looking to infrastructure projects which they would have looked to European funds for, and they're saying, well, we don't know what's going to happen. Social fund projects, when that money runs out, there will be a hiatus. The question is, how can we fill it? Will there be a guaranteed roll forward, which I think is probably the most likely um, um, uh, solution? But that is very, very problematic. And uh, as of now, we have no answers. It would be, I think, positive if a year from now, mm -hmm. you know, at this gathering in <laughs> 2018, we were able to begin to give some answers. And I would hope that would be the case, but I, I couldn't guarantee it at the moment. Great. Thank you for that last question, Ali, and thank you for that response, Minister. I'll now ask Shula Allen, the convener of SEVO, to come back onto the stage to finish up. Thank you, Shula. Thank you. Um, thank you, Theresa. Um, thank you, Minister, um, and thank you, Paul and Graham, um, for reminding us of where we are and helping us to look at where we are going. Um, very important. And I hope we can have a similar event in 2018 and continue this discussion. Um, I did have my hand up, um, but I'm aware of time constraints. I want to open the discussion about the vulnerability of human rights and where we're going with that. And hopefully we can continue to look at that. But can I thank you very much for coming and um, thank you very much for braving it to get here this morning. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you around the SECC. Thank you. Could I, could I just ask you to stay in your seats? until the podium party is left, if that's okay. Thank you, because I'm sure you'll be wanting to get to workshops. When I leave this world behind me to